Today, we become legends. Hey, my name's Inter, welcome back to the channel, and if you're new here, then be sure to subscribe for all my content coming soon. I know you guys have been hankering for some guides lately, and while I want to wait for Season 9 to make any major map or god-related guides, I can definitely make some more general purpose guides in the meantime, such as this one. So if you have a topic or topics that are more generalised and rarely change in Smite, leave a comment down below and it could be the next guide. Also, if you're looking for a specific game phase to improve at, there will be timestamps down below and on the timeline bar of the video for you to skip around, but if you watch the whole video, I'll watch your nene in return. But without further ado, let's jump in. So I'm going to start by saying that games of Smite are fluid and no two games are ever the same. Hell, most games aren't even similar in any way to others that have been played before, despite Smite having over a billion matches played. No matter what some salty hard stuck silver told you, it usually takes more than one thing going wrong to entirely lose the game. There's individual skill, team skill, overall team play, objective secures, the gods in the match, the items you're building, the items everyone else is building. You get my point. Talking in absolutes about smite matches is going to get you nowhere. Every match is fluid and if you ever want to truly get good at the core of the game and not just memorising a situation and playing out your floor chart, you need to understand that. This applies to builds too by the way, and I have a video about learning pre-made builds versus actually constructing builds yourself. The latter helps you learn the game far better. But anyway, that was just a preface since we're talking of course about early, mid and late game in this video. Three phases that have no exact definition, but people generally have a feeling about what they actually mean. Well, today I'm going to try and go a bit more in depth on each phase of a conquest game, though it can apply to other modes too, and what to do as each role in each phase. But first, let me introduce today's sponsor, the game taking the RPG genre by storm. That's right, it's Raid. With huge PvE and PvP battles, over 600 champions to build your team with, and 13 different factions, today we're going to meet the Dark Elves. Elves are like pick and mix. There's so many different types, and I want them all. In Raid, the Elves used to be under one banner, but splintered into two over a powerful evil magic they discovered. The High Elves rejected the evil power, but the Dark Elves embraced it. Fighting ensued, the High Elves won, but they won the battle, not the war. The Dark Elves are always waiting for their chance to regain what they've lost. Most of the Dark Elves will fit my team pretty well to be honest, but I really like Lydia who's a support hero, as well as Ruel the Huntmaster who gives off some serious Norse vibes. In Raid, you're not just one guy on a mission, you have a team, and crafting my team into the perfect combination of offense and defense to crush the hardest bosses is one of the most fun parts of Raid. I have Ignatius, my tank, who can take hits, Doom Priest, who has a passive heal every turn to keep my team topped up, and then whatever DPS champions I need for a certain boss. As always, there are tons of events and new things going on in Raid right now. The brand new Guardian Ring is currently under development, which allows you to augment your characters even further beyond simply leveling them up. So if you want a head start in Raid, hit the link in the description or scan the QR code on screen to get all these awesome some rewards including the epic hero Kronoru. Find your rewards here in your inbox in the next 30 days only and I will catch you guys in the raid. So you bought your items and headed to lane or the jungle. Welcome to the early game. This phase of smite lasts generally 8-10 to 10 minutes from my own experience. Again, it's not an absolute and never will be. In the early game, most roles are generally farming up and fighting their direct lane opponents. Some rotations are made in the early game by certain roles, but not all. As the solo laner in the early game, you're solely focused on getting a lead on the enemy solo. I wouldn't recommend rotating at all in the early game of solo unless you're extremely experienced. The farm you would lose can really screw over your power curve, so only rotate if you see a perfect chance and or won't miss minions. You can get a lead either by farming better than the enemy solo, aka like getting all your ways and not missing them, or winning the 1v1, or both. I've seen plenty of games where my solo is 2 kills down but up 500 gold in a level. Farming is extremely important in the early game, especially in solo, even more so than other roles. In the early game, your goal is to never miss a wave, but ultimately, you'll lose one or two. It can't really be helped unless you're literally dominating. But you can also go farm the local jungle camps such as your own blue buff, the totem of Ku, side harpy and the scorpion. Solo is more of a knowledge check role than a mechanics check role since it's generally not physically hard to play solo, but you need to know so many matchups, farming techniques, rotation paths, all this different stuff. I won't go too in depth on advanced solo strats as I literally have a video covering them that I'll link that down below. Mid laners in the early game once again are primarily looking for farm, but also to gain map dominance around the centre of the map with the assistance of the jungler. Like all classes, try not to miss any waves if possible, but mids also get access to plenty of jungle camps, either split with the jungler or soloing them in some cases, such as if your jungle is clearly not around and the camp will respawn by the time he does get there. Or your jungler has been splitting waves with you. If they're splitting waves with you, you can split camps with them without feeling bad. These camps are typically both mid camps, red buff, and occasionally some others if the situation calls for it. Mid can also rotate in the early game, but again, it's risky. If you miss one wave in the late game, no one really cares, but missing a wave in the early game is devastating. So committing to early rotations or ganks as mid is a bit of a chad play. The early game 4-man gank on duo by mid and jungle is nasty to deal with, but mids can also gank solo if they're building only physical defense and you're a mage. Don't underestimate the power of a mid to shut down a snowballing solo laner. 
Moving on though, junglers in the early game farm their jungle camps, occasionally splitting them with the mid as we discussed earlier. It works the other way too, if the mid is splitting camps with you, you can split their wave and not feel bad about it. Junglers are also looking to gank in the early game, believe it or not. Farming is still important, but the jungler is arguably the most active role in the early game in terms of fighting, and a decisive early game gank can really help snowball your team. Waiting for level 5 to get your ult on a gank is nice, but not necessary. If you feel like you'll have the kill at level 4 or 3 or whatever, you can just go for it. The starting camp rotation for jungle is start at speed buff, move to the three happy back camps, clear those, then roam to mid and either take mid camps if you can, if you're early enough, or simply pressure mid and look for other opportunities. A good farming rotation is often what separates a mediocre jungler from a great one. Getting fed can make you look like you're a god of the game, when in reality you're just farming well. Again, every game is different. I can't just say do speed, then backs, then mid, then blue, then back to speed, then green buff. Like, generally, that's not how it works. However, as a general rule, I prioritise buff camps. If any buff camps are up and it's literally not right across the map, I'll try to get them done as soon as possible. Doing other, smaller camps in between moving two buffs or when nothing else is up. Junglers get no minions, and so being conscious of your farm early in the game can be a huge help. If you're great at ganking and playing assassins but you're three levels down all the time because you can't farm, that's a problem. Alright, moving on to duo lane in the early game, we'll start with the ADC since it's an easier job early on. In lane, the ADC and support work together in a 2v2 laning phase to help out the ADC's weak early game. Your job as the ADC is very similar to solo actually, but you have to go about it in a slightly different way. By that, I mean you just need to farm. If farming gods works for you, great. If not, focus on the minions and camps. Never miss a wave if possible, farm the Draugr and the side camps when you can. ADCs with a lead are the scariest role by far since they can translate that lead into an insane late game. Be sure to work with your support in the early 2v2. A duo lane that's not amazing at the game, but on the same page and collaborating very well can easily defeat a stronger team that aren't cohesive. At some point, the support rotates out of duo lane and leaves the ADC to 1v1 the enemy. This usually happens somewhere around the 5-6 to six minute mark, give or take a minute based on the situation of the game. Once that happens, it becomes entirely your skill against the enemy's skill. But always keep farm in the back of your mind and don't get that 1v1 bloodlust everyone seems to get when the support leaves and throw the lane. I've seen it too many times in the ADC role. As for support, you know what they do in the 2v2 and that cohesion point applies to supports just as much as ADCs. You're basically looking to assist the ADC and help them with the wave clear early on, keep them alive. Once you leave, however, you'll be roaming around wherever you're most needed. If you're not super needed in the current moment though, try to just hang around mid where possible and split waves. Since it's the closest point to all of the objectives and key locations on the map, as well as where a lot of the early game fights break out. As the support, you have to leech farm. If anyone tries to tell you otherwise, they're trolling. You're a roaming role with no lane to cover, but also no camps like the jungler. You need to leech. Don't be afraid to. However, in general, try not to leech one lane or character too much as you might put them behind. But that's basically the early game of Smite. Primarily a time where you're laning and farming, but keeping your eyes peeled for any kill opportunities. The Gold Fury can technically spawn at 5 minutes in if the Scorpion is killed by that time, but objectives generally don't come into play until the mid game in most matches. Speaking of, let's cover the mid game now. Again, there's not a set time where it ticks over and you're now officially in the mid game, but generally it's between 8 and 20 minutes into the game. This doesn't mean it has to start at 8 minutes and end at 20, this is just a rough range. In the mid game, the map comes alive and many roles start rotating. Objectives come into play in a huge way, especially the Gold Fury, which is the centerpiece of the mid game and should not be taken lightly. The mid game can also be marked by the first tower or two starting to crumble, gods being around level 8 to 10 ish, or having two items complete on most gods in the match. As I said, it's also a transition. You're not early game one second, mid game the next. You scale into the mid game based on how your early game went, and the same is true for mid game going into late game. Solo lane in the mid game is similar to early but with some subtle differences. Rotations are emphasised much more heavily since if you are farming correctly in the early game, solo laners should be 1 to 2 levels up on everyone else, more if you're very fed. The mid game rotations and objective plays are really what make the early game farming worth it for solo laners. You want to be looking for rotational opportunities always. If you miss your wave for it, so be it. As the game goes later, missing one wave matters less and less. If you get a gold fury from the 5v4 you made happen by rotating, it's definitely worth losing some farm or even your own tower. The mid game is really where it starts becoming about the collective. Losing your tower sucks, but it's verifiably worth less gold than a gold fury, and so that rotation is still worth for your team overall. Don't disregard farming entirely though, you're not there yet, just keep in mind that rotations basically become about half of your job in the mid game, whereas it's about 10% of it in the early game versus 90% farm. Moving on to the mid laner in the mid game, hey. Again, team play and rotations become more important in the mid game. While the mid was already one of the team players in the early game, being part of the core 3v3, that simply becomes more prominent now. Objectives are in play as we all know and mid laners are typically the burst damage secure mechanism to prevent a steal or to be the one stealing. As I mentioned in the support section, they should be roaming around mid lane by the time you leave the early game. So be prepared to split some farm with the support, take 2v2 or 3v3 brawls with the support and our jungler and just generally roam as a group rather than individuals. 
As I said, the mid game is all about team play, objectives and map awareness. The jungler in the mid game amps up their ganks and puts farming on the back burner slightly. Again, you don't forget farming, it just becomes more of like a 50-50 thing than probably 80-20 farming in the early game for a jungler. As mentioned before, you'll often be grouping up with support and mid to form the core 3v3 of conquest and taking skirmish fights, potentially over objectives like the gold fury. Supports in the mid game have been largely covered by mid and jungle because of the nature of the core conquest 3v3, but I'll reiterate here, supports in the mid game should be rotating, no exceptions. If it's past 8-10 to 10 minutes and you're still permanently in duo lane with the ADC, you're doing it wrong. Supports should generally rotate between 4-6 to six minutes out of duo whenever they find a good opportunity to do so, like a gank, death or recall. In the mid game, you're still going to be leeching farm, so stay close to teammates that are clearing waves or camps, and stay close to them anyway, to be honest. A support is pretty useless without his carries and vice versa. As I said, the mid game is all about grouping up, fighting as a team and winning the objective game. And finally, the ADC in the mid game changes the least of all roles. Their goals are basically the same, farm up, win the 1v1, get fed, carry late game. The only thing that changes for ADCs going from early to mid game is that the goal fury is in play. You generally aren't making huge rotations to mid and definitely not to solo as the ADC in the mid game, but the gold fury is a huge part of this phase and you as the ADC are permanently next to it. Always keep it on your mind and try to ward or occasionally check gold fury if a lot of enemies are missing from the map or your lane. You're also important for getting the gold fury for your team as well. ADCs are the primary sustained damage source on objectives since basic attacks have no cooldown or mana cost. The ADC needs to be there for the gold fury most of the time, so be aware of that. Other than that though, not much changes for ADCs going from early to mid game. I'm of the opinion that no game is lost in the early game, excluding DCs and trolls of course, but it's actually in the mid game where most matches are lost. If you're caught sleeping and the enemy takes a gold fury or two or a good fight, it can really start the snowball rolling, but that applies in reverse too. Master the mid game and you can blow out matches before they even get to late game, especially with how quickly people surrender in smite. But let's cover that final phase of smite now. The late game is generally 20 minutes plus, but again, with a margin of error to account for the variety in each smite game. Sometimes late game can begin a few minutes earlier or later than this. It's a game state, not a game time. In the late game, most gods are nearing level 20 and have around 4-5 to five items online. In this phase, laning is done. No matter the role, you no longer cover your lane. This is one of the biggest mistakes brand new players make when they're new to smite. They think the only job they have is to push their lane in, but that's the exact opposite. If you go off on your own trying to push your own lane in, you'll die most of the time from a rotation of two or three people because you're out on your own. Late game is the time to group the hell up, take objectives, get involved in big meaty 5v5 team fights and ultimately kill the titan of course. The Gold Fury takes a bit of a backseat to the Big Daddy of Conquest, the Fire Giant in the late game. Gold Furies are still crucial, especially Oni and Primal, but FG is far more of a priority since its buff is often game ending if you came out of the mid game winning. Solo laners in the late game are frontline tanks in teamfights. Your job as the solo is to cause as much grief as physically possible to the enemy backliners, that's the mid and the ADC. Kill them if you can, but you don't necessarily need to directly kill them to be doing great work. If you can just keep them focused on you or crowd control, that cripples the enemy team's damage so badly and often your team can just walk over the enemy frontline if you're doing your job perfectly. As for objectives, since it's a whole different ballgame than teamfights, the solo laner can either do a similar job to a teamfighting and be a zoner, someone who keeps enemies away from your team doing the objective and creates space and safety for your team, or you can tank the objective. It's situational on which one you want to do, but I lean towards zoning since other roles can also tank the objective. But keep in mind that sometimes you will have to tank the boss as a solo laner. On offensive sieges, you do a similar thing. Tank the structure if necessary, if not, go zone the enemy damage dealers away so your own damage dealers can free cast on the phoenix or whatever it is you want to take. On defensive sieges, play the front line and keep the ADC from hitting towers at all costs. If the ADC is out of action, structures last far longer. The mid in the late game is a backline burst damage dealer. Your job is to stay as safe as possible while pumping out as much burst damage downrange as you can. I know the two things are dichotomies and you can't do both perfectly, it's a balancing act. You have to put yourself a little bit out of safety to actually land your abilities usually. Your primary targets in teamfights are any squishies you can find really, be it mid, jungle or ADC. Mid laners don't do great at killing tanks in most cases, even though Hyras are really trying to make tank shred mage builds viable. Other roles handle that better. Focus your efforts on blowing up the backline or the jungler. As for objectives, you're the primary objective secure for your team. Make sure to save a big burst damage ability for right at the end to prevent any kind of steal. But you can still of course do decent DPS to objectives also. On offensive sieges, you're mostly focusing on gods. Mages can zone as well as tanks in some cases by just putting their abilities somewhere and saying, you can't go there, or threatening to do so. If you see squishies trying to kill your tank or ADC, just blow them up. On defensive sieges, the strategy is the same. The hunter is a priority for you in this case, but you can just zone in general. The jungler in the late game plays a backline dive role, similar to the solo lane except their primary goal is to actually kill the backline. The similarity makes these two roles very complementary. If you can play a solo in teamfights, you can probably play a jungler decently too. 
Though that says nothing of early and mid game where they're far from the same. The priority target is just either of the backliners really. Take your pick on which one you think is more dangerous and take them out when you can. But especially the hunter since their DPS can easily shred down your solo laner who's also diving. Where mages typically don't have the burst damage to deal with a tanky solo diving them. So if the hunter's dead the solo kind of has free roam of the backline. For objectives you can zone, assassinate or be a DPS for the objective depending on your god and whatever role needs filling. If your ADC and mid are on the objective already and your solo is zoning, try to lurk and assassinate an out of position backliner, and vice versa. Junglers really can just play their own game in that regard around objectives, but do pay attention to your own team and what role they're currently filling in that objective attempt. On offensive sieges, you're mostly a follow up engage on the initial solo lane dive. I wouldn't recommend diving into a Phoenix against 5 people as the initiator when you're a jungler. You'll likely die or just trade yourself for one kill. Generally, I like to wait for the solo to engage since they won't insta die and then follow them in after the backline of burnt ability cooldowns on the solo. For defensive sieges, you can play the same role or play the assassin. Since it's much easier to get behind the enemy if they're sieging you versus if you're sieging them, it opens up the chance to slip around the back and pick off an unsuspecting backliner, which can hugely turn the team fight for you and your team. Alright, moving on to supports, whose job in team fight should be pretty obvious. Support your teammates, prevent them from dying whenever possible. There's a little more to it than that though. Your priority targets to keep alive are the backliners, mid and ADC. You'll be hanging around them with you'll be hanging around the back with them usually. If you can only choose one backliner to protect, go for the one doing the best. It sounds harsh to let the guy who's feeding die again, but if you're being pragmatic and want to actually win, that's the play. However, where sieges are concerned, prioritise the ADC since they do the vast majority of the structure damage on the team. Supports can go aggressive also, playing more like a solo laner, and this depends on your god really, but in general most supports hang back most of the time. Only going in when an opportunity presents itself or their carries don't need them. Also, a quick note that if your solo and jungle can or refuse to engage, you can do that as support sometimes too with good engage tools like Gebolt and Terror Root, things like that. For objectives, the support generally tanks it. This is far from always true, ADCs with a lot of lifesteal and solo liners can also tank pretty well, but the ADC wants to keep safe and the solo generally wants to dive or zone, so tanking falls to the support most of the time. Again though, not always the case. Read your current match rather than using a flowchart. That's what this video has really been all about. On offensive sieges, you generally stay back and protect your backliners from dies while your own solo and jungle make the engage. But if needed, you can also tank the structure since you have no problem with that as a tanky support. On defensive sieges, the role just flips to you protecting your backliners from the enemy solo and jungle dives since you have no tanking to worry about. Again, you can also get aggressive and engage if you feel it's right to do it in that moment. That's what adapting to the game is all about. If you've been told to protect the backline but you see a 5 man blink gebbled opportunity, you gotta go for it. Live a little. But finally we have the ADCs. I've talked about them a fair bit already since of course late game is all about the team and how each role works to support each other role and form a cohesive team. ADCs in teamfights sit in the backline just like the mid, however their damage type and goals are quite different. And I don't mean physical versus magical damage, I mean sustained DPS versus burst damage. ADCs are all about just pumping constant damage outrange due to their basic attacks not having cooldowns like abilities do. ADCs can actually build two ways, the crit build destroys squishies more and the kin size pen build destroys tanks more, but I'm not going to go super in depth on that today. It was simply to make the point that hunters can easily shred tanks in the late game and it's arguably half their job. The mid can't really kill tanks very effectively as we discussed earlier and so it often falls to the ADC to melt those tanks with their no cooldown high penetration basic attacks and items like kin size. That doesn't mean you can't kill squishies too though, you absolutely are capable of both as the ADC once you make it to the promised land of late game. For objectives, we've mentioned before but it's purely to pump DPS into the boss. Of course you can peel off the objective and take a fight if the enemy contests, any role can do that. But generally you're just looking to DPS it down. Sieges are similar, focus on the structure, not gods in general. Sieges are similar, focus on the structure, generally not on the gods. Only focus gods if it's a free kill on a platter or if they're diving you and you have to pay attention to them. Otherwise just burn the phoenix because probably no one else on your team can do it like you do. On defensive sieges, pump damage into the tanks so they can't well, tank. The siege falls apart if the enemy solo and support get low, so that's your main job. But yeah, pay attention, and if you're getting dived, shift your focus. Adapt. And finally, before we close out what's turned into a longer video than expected, I'll briefly touch on the hyper late game. This isn't really an actual thing, but some people recognise it. It's basically when all gods are level 20 with full build, and all there really is to do is team fight and close out the game. But that's it. Hopefully this helped you improve your skills in a specific game phase in your role or just generally improved your smite understanding. If it did, don't forget to drop a like before you leave and I'll catch you guys in another one later on. Have a great day and peace out you nerds.